the trees regarding our gender identity and sexuality. When there's no place like home, empty air and empty stairs. Civil rights out on the cruel streets tonight. Happy Pride to listeners everywhere. A couple of weeks ago, the European Parliament organized an event to coincide with International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. It primarily consisted of a panel discussion to highlight LGBTQ plus youth and mental health. It was held in Dublin and the panellists were Maria Walsh MEP, the former Rose of Tralee, Meninia Griffith, who is the CEO of Belong to Youth Services, and Rory O'Neill. It was chaired by Afrik Nikristoin from Spun Out. Later in the programme, we will be telling you more about how you can join in and enjoy a fabulous day out at Dublin 2020 to LGBTQ plus pride. Um, my name is Salula Croker. I'm the head of media here at the European Parliament Office in Dublin. And we're delighted to welcome you here today, uh, both in person and online. It's a particular joy since this is our very first live event here in Europe House since January 2020. Um, so 2022 is the European Year of Youth. And uh, last week was the European Week of European Mental Health Week. Uh, so it's particularly appropriate, it's very timely to mark the International Day for Homophobia, Biphobia, uh, Intersexism and Transphobia with a discussion on mental health and young LGBTQ uh, plus people. We have a first phase panel, um, and I'd like to warmly welcome Maria, uh, Afrik, Melina, and Rory. Uh, I can think of no better people, no better qualified and more informed people to lead a discussion on these issues. And we're looking forward to a stimulating, dis a stimulating discussion. Um, I know from work at the European Parliament that this is an issue that's particularly close to Maria's heart. On behalf of the European Parliament Liaison Office in Dublin, uh, who have invited you here today, and in association with the European Commission Representation Office in Ireland, uh, we would like to thank the panel for making the funds available. I'd like to thank our colleague Jeremy O'Sullivan for all his work in planning and organising today's event. Uh, thank you to our intern, Rory Walsh, who will be going around to photograph, to take some photographs for social media. And anyone who prefer not to be photographed uh, is invited to sit at the back. Um, <laughs> 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 thank you also to the Gay Community News for streaming this event live. And uh, finally, thank you to you, the audience, for your support in coming here today and in watching online. Uh, we'd invite you to stay for a cup of tea after the discussion. And uh, I'll now pass over to Afi. Thank you. Hi, folks, and hello to everyone online as well. Thank you, GCN, for covering this today. Uh, we're really glad to be here to mark the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Interphobia and Transphobia, which took place on Tuesday. My name is Anthony Creadon, my pronouns are she and her. I am the Executive Director of Shoutout, which is a national charity working to promote LGBTI inclusion in schools and workplaces through education, dialogue and storytelling. And I'm really glad to be here in that context to moderate this discussion around mental health issues and those faced by young LGBTI plus people in our communities in the context of I the Hobbit and also ongoing developments around LGBTI equality and human rights in Europe. The research published by ILGA Europe last week on the status of LGBTI rights makes clear the impact of homophobia, biphobia, interphobia and transphobia across the region. And it notes the rise, which I think we've all been concerned about, in anti-LGBTI rhetoric, the related violence which has come from that, especially against trans and non-binary communities right across, right across the region. ILG Europe in the report also emphasised the need in almost every country for further protections for LGBTI plus people, particularly in freedom of expression, access to education, healthcare, gender recognition, recognition of parenthood and access to employment. The report also notes, and I suppose it's particularly relevant to today's conversations, 
the ongoing concerns for the mental health of LGBTI plus young people across Europe. And we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in the Irish and the European context today. In Ireland this weekend actually marks seven years since marriage equality, which was such a landmark moment for our community in terms of visibility and in terms of progress and what felt like a huge piece of progress that had been so long in the works and so long overdue. But nearly a decade later, the next generation of LGBTI young people in this country are still struggling to build a positive future for themselves, They're still struggling to find that positive outlook. We know from Irish research that these teenagers and these young people face higher rates of suicidal ideation, self-harm, depression and anxiety than their peers. They face bullying, discrimination and rejection in their schools, homes and communities. And we also know, thanks to Belong To's Life in Lockdown research, that this has worsened over COVID because of the uncertainty and the isolation that those young people faced over the years. So I'm really glad and looking forward to this discussion around the issues faced by LGBTI young people, along with Mary Walsh, MEP, Vanilla Griffith, CEO of Belong To Youth Services, and Rory O'Neill, aka Hantibus. Yeah, first, start the hard questions with him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, just in terms of this topic in the EU context, um, what work is currently ongoing to address the mental health issues that are faced by young people across the region? Um, and especially post-COVID, what does that work look like? Yeah, in terms of uh, mental health, hello everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to see some fellow representatives uh, in the room and I uh, just want to thank uh, Europe House for, for having us, uh, the, the team in particular. Uh, because it's not, and, and, I, and I say this with, uh, with obviously a biased head as an Irish representative, but not every European um, uh, member state has uh, acknowledged uh, Ida Hobbit um, um, and hasn't organised opportunities like this and in many cases hasn't even linked LGBTQI plus issues with mental health and I think that's incredibly uh, important. Um, you know, from a European standpoint, and just a little bit on my own work, uh, I'm a vice chair of the intergroup on LGBTQI uh, uh, rights within the European Parliament. Um, we're a, a pan-political party, so we have representation from right across the house, far the far right, um, out of their choice, not, not out of ours. Um, and we look at issues not just in the European context, but also in a wider, in a wider space. And working with MEPs at a national, local level, particularly in countries like Poland and Hungary right now, and even in our own Irish community, because we're not getting everything right either. Um, when you look at then the, the mental health through the prism of LGBTQI rights and vice versa, uh, there's definitely huge scope Unfortunately, and, and something I, I ran and I talked about a lot in 2019 European elections was mental health is everybody's business, in particularly those from LGBTQI community groups or um, minority groups like our Traveller community members, um, uh, those coming into Ireland or Europe in, in, into the first uh, instances. Um, rural versus urban now because uh, is, is closer together, but um, certainly there is difference there. and. For me, I think we could have the strongest currency and um, certain elements right now that's going on geopolitically could be sorted out. But if we do not have citizens who are able to show up um, in themselves, in their communities, in the workspaces, in volunteer projects or education, then what are we doing? Um, and that was a huge disconnect for me. And um, even looking at the farming community, and we have a number of LGBTQI community members in the farming sector, you know, on average, there's about um, statistically about 25 deaths by suicide per year. I mean, I'd actually uh, double if not triple that number. Um, and that's just what's known within communities. Uh, and then the ripple effect of mental health pressures from that. And, and for me, when we talk about mental health, and, and we do this within the intergroup in the parliament, you know, there's mental well-being. And if anybody's in the space, uh, and I'm phrasing this wrong, please correct me, because I think what's most important about these conversations is we're all just aligning each other in similar messages and, and, and correcting uh, and, and learning. Um, but there's mental well-being, um, mental health and mental illness. And at any point, over the course of a day even, we can move through all three. Um, and if we don't have the structures in place, as an LGBTQI individual in the parliament then, um, you know, statistically, we're not a lot, but actually we are quite a, quite a number. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, LGBTQI individuals um, within politics right across the realm that doesn't doesn't come out and 
and where that impacts is in a legislation amendment. So when you have, we might put forward something on mental health and LGBTQI, say in um, uh, a reception centre in Italy or Greece uh, or Malta, um, and you'd have a number of people, both left and right of the house, holding it down, even though within their communities they have LGBTQI community members who are experiencing um, mental health uh, pressures in all its forms. So. Uh, we have a great LGBTI strategy from our commissioner, uh, Dali, who is the most pro-LGBTI individual I could come across uh, from Malta. Uh, but within that, you also don't have elements of trans rights or, or women's rights, um, uh, and it's all its form. So while it seems in, in some cases we're taking 10 steps ahead and then 15 steps back, but um, but the likes of Ida Hobbit, the likes of... Um, Pride events right across the world, the, the, the way African communities in particular, like Uganda, are speaking out, then it creates that general message. And I promise I'll keep my answer shorter. That's one thing <laughs> that's one thing you told me to do. Well, subtly. <laughs> but I think in terms of that, it's very hard to yeah. yeah. But there's so much to play. Let's be on our roll. <laughs> and I think it's really it's really valuable to look at it in the context of where we are and the different communities that we have to care for and serve here um, and also that broader international solidarity piece and what Ireland's voice is in that context as well. Um, I mean, bear in mind Ireland and I say to my party leaders all the time we still haven't banned conversion therapy. It's embarrassing. It's actually embarrassing. It's fundamentally an inhumane uh, in to do so. Since 2008 there has been in council an anti-horizontal uh, um, uh, directive say so an anti-discrimination uh, bill that has yet to be passed uh, since 2008, and it's the foundation for all uh, fundamental rights in terms of sexuality, creed, mother tongue, um, and some member states are blocking it, and when they don't have a unified approach, then it rolls back. So you, you're left scratching your head, so you know, how can we talk about solidarity in its all form, but then not play its part? And, and it takes time, unfortunately, and it also takes members within the communities in the breath running, participating, and, and, and really forcing and pushing us public reps to make sure that we're listening um, and that we're drawing those issues to the, to the fore. And something which is becoming such a part of the conversation here around conversion therapy. And <laughs> conversion therapy as a huge piece linking to mental health in terms of who practices conversion therapy and in terms of the impacts and the effects of conversion therapy on those who are subject to it. And we've seen how painful it's been for our trans and non-binary siblings in the UK and Northern Ireland who are being left behind by the conversion therapy ban. I was wondering if you might be able to speak to the work around conversion therapy here and the impact it is having on LGBTI plus people here. Sure. I, I mean, I suppose it's become topical of late um, because other countries have, have now banned it. Um, something that has been going on in Ireland uh, a, a long time, and uh, honestly, until I uh, join the team we belong to. I, I, I never knew about it, but I was in the I was in situ about six months, and I got um, a call from one of our youth workers saying that uh, she'd been contacted by a young Irish citizen who was in one of these camps in Germany um, with no passport, no money, um, uh, and his dad had sent him there because he'd caught him with his boy, a boyfriend. And, uh, and, and really he was up at the crack of dawn, seven days a week, working on a farm, praying, um, and uh, all this kind of stuff, having grown up in a particularly religious house or anything like that. But, um, so it was the, my first, now, the great, great story about that is that the, the Department of Foreign Affairs were amazing and, and worked with us and with activists in Germany, and um, that individual is now living a great life um, so that that was really a, a happy uh, ending but but it was my first experience I suppose or exposure to it and I couldn't believe that this stuff was going on I mean I could see it in movies and <coughs> in, 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 you know um, um, from the US but I couldn't believe that it's happening here but it is so I mean the classic uh, kind of understanding of that is you know your child is sent away to a camp or you know to some sort of a, um, a retreat um, usually religious based, um, uh, usually kind of some Christian kind of a camp or something like that, but not always. So well, that's why we, we, when we talk now about conversion therapy, we talk about conversion practices as well. So um, 
And so in countries like Canada, they have successfully brought in legislation that, that ban it. But, and, and really, and, and, the, and the, the important thing as well here in Ireland is not to be, to fall into that fake kind of idea that well, we ban it in relation to uh, gay, gay and lesbian bisexual people around sexual orientation, but not about gender identity. We can't allow that to happen because it's fundamentally the, 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 the same thing. If you are a, a, a doctor, a therapist, a medical professional, you're, you're, you, what you want to do is work with the patient so that they, they become uh, healthy again. And so if somebody is experiencing trauma, um, uh, is experiencing anxiety or depression, your end result is that, that, that you help them work through that so that they feel better. If you're going into a therapist who's uh, final destination is that you don't become that you aren't gay or that you aren't trans. Well, then that's not counselling. That's not the therapeutic. That has a, an ideological agenda uh, um, with a, an outcome that's predetermined, and that's what needs to be valued here in Ireland. So, um, so there's a lot of kind of myths and, and fake news going around, around. You know, the worry around if we, if we ban it, it's going to stop therapists being able to. Any therapist I've spoken to, any counsellor, any medical professional I've spoken to, the, the, the professional bodies um, agree that that's not the case. You know, they, they, there are ways to uh, ban this harmful practice, these harmful practices, while allowing uh, counsellors to, to work in a therapeutic space with, uh, with people who are experiencing um, mental health problems. Um, may be associated with their gender identity or their sexual orientation without predetermining the outcome in terms of them deciding am I trans or, or am I just confused about my gender identity. So that's that's where we're at. So in Ireland at the moment the, we, the, um, there's a coalition uh, working um, on the ban and we're working with our colleagues in Northern Ireland as well for, for a ban all over Ireland because that's what happens that um, um, many of these, um, some of the therapists are all over Ireland that, that would uh, probably fall into this practice, but some of the camps, I suppose, um, that we know of would be around border counties, and that's so there's a lot of cross border cooperation uh, between activists trying to end these harmful practices. And it's across, it's across the country, it's across the island, and it's, I think, one of the most harrowing examples of what might be happening to a young LGBTI person, but it's also not the sole root of the issues that LGBTI young people are struggling with today in terms of their mental health. And I think it feels like a throwback to something from 30, 40 years ago, to the stories of older LGBTI people. And I guess that's a question as well, which I might put to Rory just around, what pressures you think exist for LGBTI young people now that actually didn't exist 10, 20 years ago? How have things changed for the worse in some ways? Or how are LGBTI people struggling now in a way that they might not have 20 years ago. Well, things have changed dramatically in this country, as we all know. It's funny, we were just beforehand, I was remarking how I was down in my small town of Balmero, County Mayo, just before the pandemic, to help launch a booklet produced by the local um, youth club who have a gay group within the local youth club, and it was a guide to coming out. Um, Balmero is a population of less than 2,000. It's, you know, has two pubs left in it. So, you know, when I was going out there, I thought I was literally the only gay person in the whole wide world. Um, well, me and Liberace, maybe. And, then, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, to be going back to that town now and seeing that, and, you know, the two kids got up and spoke. Uh, they both had Polish surnames, and, you know, the boy had, like, gold painted fingernails. And it blew my mind. Um, you know, sort of the, the, the journey we've made, that doesn't, of course, mean that everything's uh, hunky-dory and fine, and it's, it's instructive to me that, that they felt so concerned um, about it, that they wanted to produce their own booklet um, to help young people you know, navigate coming out and all that, even in modern Ireland. But, you know, Maria mentioned Ireland's voice, and, um, you know, if I can say something positive here, um, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned since our marriage equality referendum and all that is the power of Ireland's voice. Um, and of course, we've always known that Ireland has sort of an outsized voice on the international stage for a whole for a host of reasons. But what I've really learned in the last few years is the power of Ireland's actual story around these things. Um, 
you know, I do a lot of, or certainly pre-pandemic, did a lot of, you know, work with the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, and yet another weird twist in my life. And um, <laughs> and, uh, and and I've been, you know, to a lot of countries where it's incredibly difficult um, and it's often downright dangerous um, to be out of ETI plus, um, you know, today. And they range from South Africa to Turkey to Poland to um, Bosnia Herzegovina. And and I'm so often struck. Um, by the power of Ireland's story and being told in those places. Um, and I often, you know, to give you one example that I often think about, um, I was in, uh, in Sarajevo, and, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Sarajevo, but it's an incredibly difficult place to be LGBTI+. Um, uh, there's, there's no gay bar in Sarajevo. There is one sort of misfit bar, the kind of place you might recognize without in the 1980s. Um, you know, where there'd be a few punks in one corner, uh, you know, a couple of, you know, hit rockabillies in another, and a couple of lesbians in the other, you know, and, um, and, and when I was there, that bar had been attacked three times in the previous three months by neo-Nazis, and in the last attack, they dragged the barman outside and beaten the crap out of him on the pavement. So, you know, being queer there is difficult and depressing, and, um, and I was doing my thing at the small theatre, and outside they had these big poster sites, and normally they had these big colourful posters, so what's going on inside? But you know, the poster for my show was just black and white text because they didn't want to put a picture of an obviously queer person. Um, they had they hired extra security for the theatre that night because they were concerned that it might attract the wrong kind of attention. They had to liaise with the local police um, about it, and afterwards, you know, did a little meet and greety thing in, in the theatre bar. Um, it was a very hot security man, and of course, Panty got a picture with him for that reason only. But you know, then when I was in the dressing room, the manager comes back um, to ask me to delete those pictures because the security man was concerned that that picture might end up on the internet, and then you know there'd be repercussions. Even though all he was doing was his job as security at an event, and, and I had superseded the picture. But most, what struck me most was um, in the bar, a 17-year-old lesbian came up to me and you know, thanked me for being there, and I was like, "Well, I should be thanking you because." Just coming to the event was a kind of act of defiance or, or bravery in that case. And, um, and she was understandably kind of worn down. And you know, to a 17-year-old I mean, in that situation, um, the idea that nothing will ever change, that nothing could possibly ever change, that the change that she wants is too dramatic, too big, to ever be something worth hope, hoping for, and was really weighing heavily on her. And, the incredible thing is that I was able to sort of tell her Ireland's story and tell her, you know, when I was 17, Dublin wasn't that much different than Sarajevo is now. May not have been as outwardly sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the threat of violence may not have been there as often. But, you know, there were no gay bars out in Pride, Pride in Dublin in the 1980s. Nobody could hold hands in the streets in Dublin in the 1980s. Being a, you know, a young lesbian in the 1980s in Dublin was lonely. Um, hard, difficult, um, you know, finding other queer people, you know, you need to get Angela Lansbury on the case, um, you know. And so it is amazing to be able to tell someone in a situation like that Ireland's story, because I think Ireland's story is a sort of a beacon, um, it's a light in the dark in a way, because it proves that deep and dramatic social change is a thing possible. And, and it's, it's possible in a relatively short period of time, you know, in the scheme of social change. So I actually love um, going to those places and being able to tell our story. Um, and I think it's one of the things that Ireland, it has been good, and certainly the Department of Foreign Affairs, I give credit where credit is due, has been good in telling that story and finding different ways to tell that story. And, and I think this is one area where Ireland can rightly uh, take a leading leadership role. Um, perhaps even more than it does at the moment, although I will give credit, it has you know, done to, to an extent. Um, and so I don't think Ireland should ever be um, bashful about singing, you know, about the good things that we have achieved, um, while being very cognizant of course that we haven't achieved everything, and, and, and as recent cases and things have shown, there's still work to be done, but um, I, I, I certainly am. Uh, Still very proud of what Ireland has managed to achieve, and I'd like to be able to tell it. Well, it is that time of the year again, 
and I'm referring to none other than the return of Dublin LGBTQ plus pride. It's a very welcome return because this year will be the first time in three years that the event has taken place live. The past two years it's been virtual because of COVID and pandemics and all sorts of things. My memory of 2019 Pride is still very strong because it was such a fabulous event and I have every expectation that it will be at least as good if not better in 2022. So a little bit more about the uh, the big day. Now while there are other events taking place around Pride and I'll, you, I'll tell you about them at another time, the big event, of course, will be the Dublin Pride Parade, and that takes place on the 25th of June. That's a Saturday. It will take place, roughly speaking, between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. It will begin up in Parnell Square, roughly speaking, around the Garden of Remembrance, and gradually will wind its way down O'Connell Street, along the Quays, up through Westland Row, or Pierce, whatever it is, Pierce Station that you call it, finally completing uh, its journey in Marion Square where weather permitting there will be fabulous entertainment and just an all-round incredible day. Last time around as I said I had one of the best days of my life and I'm not expecting it to be any different this year. Although it's not been officially announced yet I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that the grand marshal for 20 uh, Dublin LGBTQ plus 22 uh, Pride will be none other than Rebecca de Havilland Tallon. Uh, that may be going out on a limb, but I'm fairly confident that that prediction will turn out right. So whether you're L or G or B or T or Q or I or A, um, or even none of those things, just join everybody. It's a terrific day out. Uh, and you'll meet some fabulous people and you'll have a terrific time as well. So why not join the community, celebrate pride and show solidarity. Friends of Dorothy, come out off the sidewalk and onto the street to the sound of those legendary Yeah.